strong communities lead to strong and successful sustainable initiatives like it top down stuff doesn't always work like you need to have bottom up support Welcome to the Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello everyone, we are back today talking again about circular economy. I had the pleasure a couple of weeks ago of talking with Rachel Houlihan about circular economy in architecture. Today my guest is, strangely enough, another Dubliner called Steve O'Reilly, and we talk again about circular economy, but this time in broader terms and about how it is manifesting in Ireland. Steve works in a policy and communications role at Ireland's National Centre for the Circular Economy, the Rediscovery Centre. Steve spent over seven years in the Netherlands, Europe's circular economy hotspot, working on many projects related to circularity and becoming inspired by the circular innovation he saw there. Upon returning to Ireland during the pandemic, Steve took up a position in the Rediscovery Centre in Dublin to help drive circularity back in Ireland. If you've never heard of circular economy or circular circularity before, here's a quick explanation. Most of our economic activities right now are linear. We harvest materials from the earth, turn them into products, use them for a while, and then throw them away where they become waste. This is how most of our stuff is made, and it's clear that this system is incredibly carbon intensive and destructive for the environment. Circular economic activities greatly reduce the extraction of new materials and the creation of waste by keeping existing products and materials in use through repair, reuse and recycling. It's a hugely important concept that has the potential to dramatically change how large parts of our economy run from construction to fashion. In this episode, Steve shares insights into the social potential for circularity, how it is blossoming in rural communities, and what we can learn from the Dutch. For now, please enjoy my episode with Steve. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the Green Urbanist Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Can you just start by telling us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm um, originally from Dublin and Ireland. Um, I'm now back in Dublin uh, permanently after eight years of living in the Netherlands, working in various positions related to communications, design, built environment, um, and learning by osmosis really from the Dutch about the Mm -hmm. the circular economy. The Dutch are way ahead of the curve on circularity. And my my partner actually also works, she works for, um, works in this topic and lectures on this topic related to circular textiles. Um, so now, I mean, I moved back to Ireland during the pandemic and I'm, I'm very fortunate to work for uh, the Rediscovery Centre, which is Ireland's uh, National Centre for the Circular Economy. And I work in a policy and communications role there, leading various um, EU and government funded projects um, that have a goal really of fostering the circular economy in Ireland. So um, creating public understanding, awareness about what the circular economy actually is um, mm. and trying to show people that it can really be beneficial to to their lives beyond um, the environmental benefits. Brilliant. Um, my, what might be a good way, a good way of sort of uh, moving this is if you can tell us, like, from your point of view, what's the state of the circular economy in Ireland? Um, also, just personally, I've been away from Ireland for like, God, how long? Seven years or something. So I'm very out of touch with what's going on back there, unfortunately. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) me as a a relative outsider now, tell me, and a lot of the listeners will be obviously from outside Ireland. So what is going on there? Um, And then maybe from there, tell us a bit about the the Rediscovery Center and what you're trying to do. Oh my God. Okay. That's a, a big question. Like the, the, in terms of, in terms of the state of the circular economy in Ireland, like it really depends on who you ask. Mm. Like if you ask someone who works in policy, which I mean, the Rediscovery Centre work do, does have a policy um, arm to it, which I work in. Um, but if you ask someone who works in policy how what the state of the circular economy is in Ireland, they'll say it's going great. You know, and <laughs> we have a minister with responsibility for the circular economy uh, now, Oisín Smith. He's a Green Party TD from Dunleary, and um, I think that's unique, or it's it, it's at least very rare. Um, yeah. So it's it's really useful to have an ear at cabinet, you know, uh, for for 
to push the circular economy. And the government, you know, at the time of recording this podcast, it's going to be publishing its circular economy strategy really soon, you know, building on uh, the waste action plan for a circular economy that that's already underway. And there's a like this whole chapter dedicated to the circular economy in the government's climate action plan. And um, the government has a new circular economy bill going through the Houses of Parliament. God, I could go on like, you know, the EPA has the Environmental Protection Agency has a circular economy program. Um, and there's other things that have come to light as well, like a deposit return scheme for drinking containers um, and a lot of policy that are that would be um, maybe wouldn't relate to the circular economy and now have circular economy um, layers to them, like the mm. Our Rural Future policy from the Department of Rural and Community Development. Like that's that has highlighted the circular economy and the social economy, social enterprise as a way to regenerate rural Ireland after the pandemic. So there's there's a lot of stuff happening across government now at the moment, and it's it's really exciting. And that's it's just and that's all building on the back of the EU's initiatives, like the EU mm. Green Deal, um, the right to repair. And, you know, all this stuff has just happened in the last year, you know, like it's really ballooning at the moment. And, and us and the policy team of the Rediscovery Centre, we're like just backed up with all of this stuff. Um, and it's it's really exciting. And um, But if you ask someone from the waste sector what the state of the circular economy is in Ireland, they'll tell you a totally different story. You know, mm. I mean we're going really in the wrong direction with regards to our the how much waste we produce we're producing more we're burning more we're recycling less like our recycling rates have decreased and the ambition for recycling rates to increase have decreased so ultimately and ultimately as well we're 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 exporting the problem to other countries because we just don't have the the infrastructure in Ireland um to recycle the amount of waste that we're producing yeah um, so, and this is across all sectors of society, like construction, hazardous waste, municipal waste, packaging waste. Um, I could go into the statistics, but I won't scare you with them. Um, but if you go onto the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Irish Environmental Protection Agency, if you go onto their website, they've just published um, their updated statistics on waste. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's going in the wrong direction, you know. Um, but there's hope as well. Like the the... If you look to the education sector, um, there's a lot of a lot of Irish universities, especially third level, are building out their circular economic uh, programs or education. So NCAD, the National College of Art and Design, has just hired their circular economy lead to build out to ensure that the circular economy becomes part of design education there. So that's positive. You know, DCU wow. have, a, have a climate and society um, uh, center. That, that are doing incredible work. Galway Mayo IT have a really good um, circular economy program. Trinity has um, are, are doing a lot with food. They also have materials. And they're actually, they're, they're starting a postgrad um, that's just been announced about circular economy and recycling technology. So I suppose like policy going well, education is getting there, actual on the ground waste production. It's really quite poor. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a really good summary. And I think that's probably, I mean, it sounds like it's it's early days, maybe. And hopefully yeah. the action will catch up with the policy. But I hope so. Well, maybe, okay, well, give us some hope. Tell us what the Rediscovery Centre are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Rediscovery Centre, I think like, I mean, it's the National Centre for the Circular Economy. You know, as I mentioned, we have a policy and research team, but really our you know, we're not like other circular economy hubs that you might be familiar with, like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, CITRA, like Zero Waste Scotland. You know, we're not a, um, we didn't start out as a government funded thing. Like we're a grassroots initiative that started as part of a community regeneration in our local area. Um, so we're based in a, a, um, a part of Dublin that um, Irish people might be familiar with. It's called Ballymun, the area. And it was, um, it was essentially Ballymun was a social housing project that was designed and built in the 1960s to rehouse families and communities living in very poor quality homes in the north inner city of Dublin. Um, and they essentially these communities, like they were moved to Ballymun, provided with state of the art at the time, you know, state of the art architectural homes, uh, big brutalist um, <laughs> kind of tower blocks. There were about 3,000 developments, 3,000 home sorry that were that were heated by district heating and that district heating thing is important and i'll come back to it but they weren't apart from that those homes they weren't really provided with other um 
other stuff, other, other infrastructure, like there was poor social infrastructure that led to people feeling isolated on the edges of cities, uprooted. It became known, the area became known for social issues, unemployment. It was also impacted very negatively by, by media coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the late 1990s, it became really clear that Ballymun needed to be totally regenerated. Um, the flats were demolished and, you know, issues were addressed, but... The Rediscovery Centre, like our, sorry, all of this is to essentially say that the roots of the Rediscovery Centre are in community regeneration. Like uh-huh. we're, we have a social um, core uh, to solve not only environmental problems, but social problems as well um, and economic problems. Like we actually started out as a public consultation. Um, so the, the government were asking the people of Ballymun like what they wanted. And the, the vision at the time was like a community recycling centre that would create jobs, that would create provide skills for the local community and deal with waste that was produced by the community. So we that's that's how we started out. Like we started out as a, a being embedded in the community and we ballooned from there um over time to becoming the national centre for the circular economy. Hmm. Um, and we now have lots of different initiatives. Like we have an education team, we have four social enterprises um, within the centre. We have a that and these social enterprises they take what some people might call waste and they upcycle them into things that you can buy in our, in our shop. And that kind of, you know, keeps us afloat. Um, but we also have a cafe, we have a shop, we have a, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we're, we're essentially now um, a space where people can come and learn about the circular economy in action um, on a human scale and also on an architectural scale. Like the building, the building, the rediscovery center is in our home itself. It is the, the Ballymun boiler house. <laughs> so this is this used to be the district heating uh, system where all of the hot water would be pumped out to the flats of Ballymun. Um, and while uh, during the process of the, the regeneration of Ballymun, we asked to uh, refurbish this building for it to become our home. And we got um, EU funding to do it. Um, and now like the building itself is an exemplar of circular economic architecture. You know, like it's, Passive design, you know, it's it's it makes optimum use of of natural light. It's also a flexible design, so it's designed for future use. And um, it's heat, it's heating and electricity. We've got five different types of energy creation on site, and we've got rainwater harvesting, compost toilets, and um, we got a reed bed system to filter out any grey water, and um, we got green roofs, green living walls. We have a biodiversity, you know, embedded within the the actually and actually um. The ur- you can you can, if you come to the center you can make a, a donation of urine that will be collected <laughs> and will and will be piped up to our internal living wall so that the, the the plants that are there um feed off the phosphorus and the nitrates in your in human urine so it's um through the 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 center itself like the center itself is the circular economy in action so I suppose I when that. people, it's it it is a visitor center. Like when people come there, um, they through the exploration of the building, through through it, their interaction with it, are invited to learn about the circular economy. Yeah, if that makes sense. I went on a big spiel there. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you if you practice what you preach, and that's really um, yeah, really good to see. So, do do people? You know, you said there's a lot happening with regards to policy, with regards to education. Do you think people in Ireland actually know what the circular economy is or, or interact with it? Um, good question. Uh, and I suppose, like, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands, you know, in a little bubble of people who know a lot about the circular economy. So, um, you know, moving back to Ireland, I, was, I had my expectations high, uh, but really public awareness is not very high in Ireland, you know, up until recently, up until recently, we were actually, we were, we were unsure as to whether that was true. Like it was our assumption that people didn't know. Um, but now we're undertaking a piece of government funded uh, market research um, to benchmark public awareness um, understanding and acceptance of the circular economy. Um, and hopefully by the time this podcast is, is out, it will be completed and we'll have the details to show everybody so I don't I don't necessarily want to go into the details and the findings now, mm-hmm. um, but I can I can I suppose I can sum up by saying that yeah no one really knows about it, and ultimately nobody cares about it unless or actually people do care about it people do but a, there's a big cohort of society that that don't have the headspace to care about it yeah because yeah. it it needs to answer the more urgent needs in their life 
like they've got bigger fish to fry essentially and that that's the determining factor be- between who has the capacity or the willpower to become a circular consumer and who doesn't you know if you've got if housing is an issue for you, if healthcare is an issue for you, if you're trying to make ends meet, if you're living in energy poverty, like you're not going to have the headspace to change your consumer habits to become mm. more sustainable. Um, and usually the lower down on Laszlo's hierarchy of needs, you know, the lower down it is, the more pressing it is. You know, we've, we saw in the pandemic when health became a big issue, that interest in sustainability um, decreased. Um, so people really only have the headspace to care about to care about a certain amount of stuff um yeah and i suppose like the environment even though it's the thing that all life really depends on it's probably going to be on the back foot because it's seen as being a less immediate need maybe um you know if the argument that the world is on fire was strong enough or immediate enough or relevant enough you know things might have changed things would have changed quicker by now um so the reality is like a, a large portion of people aren't going to have the headspace um to care about the environment no matter no matter what you do um so in communicating about the circular economy we need to frame it as being beneficial to people's well-being to their health to their quality of life to their financial situation um and that actually goes beyond how we communicate it like it needs in the way that the circular economy manifests it needs to be linked to a better version of how our society is uh, and how our economy can prioritize well-being um, and for it to not just be uh, an environmental concern, I would say. Well, that, that's that's brilliant. I mean, I think you've hit on so many points there. I had someone on the podcast a good few months ago called um, Virginia, and she's she teaches people how to sell sustainable sustainability. Right. Um, right. And she had this concept that she said, when you're coming up with a solution to a problem, mm-hmm. She said, you know, just come up with the best solution. And by the way, it's also the most sustainable. Yes. And she said, you don't even have to tell people it's the most sustainable if that's not something that they care about. Yeah. But exactly. the best solution will be sustainable. And it feels like the same thing with circular economy. The totally. term circular economy f- sounds quite technical and abstract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you really need someone to explain to you what it means. And even yeah. then it, you might be like, why am I, why do, why would I care about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even like, I mean, that that is totally true and even like there are pockets of people in irish society who are a lot more sustainable than they know or they they might they might might even recognize like there might be a you know granny in donegal who never throws anything out who repairs everything that she owns um and that's i mean that's ultimately much more sustainable than somewhat a gen z person who might have very lofty sustainable ambitions but that goes and takes flights to indonesia because right. they feel that it's their right to you know um so it's 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 very much like there's a disconnect between what people are um doing and what they're saying they do um, <laughs> and also what people on on both sides like on the unsustainable side and on the sustainable side um so yeah i suppose we need to make the link between the two maybe um what yeah. what what would be some of the examples you would give to people like how how it could improve their lives mm. or society in more I, would, I, I mean i would say a, a lot of people see um circular um actually that's a really good question like uh, uh, oh, i don't really want to give away any of our market research because it's so good <laughs> um but let's see i suppose like a lot of people when they're they're thinking about the circular economy because it's something that's not familiar to them um they link it to what they already know like they might link it to packaging or plastics or things like mm. that but the benefits of it can really it, it, the circular economy can really open up access to things that you might not otherwise be able to afford um mm. so for example um there's a, a clothing library in amsterdam called lena and rather than you having to purchase every item that you might want to own like you can just pay for access to essentially a communal wardrobe that you walk into and you get access to really high quality designer clothing that otherwise you just wouldn't be able to, nice. to get. And the same can be said for tool libraries, for um, any kind of libraries, really. Like, I mean, rather than having to um, buy a lawnmower or a chainsaw or whatever you might need in your home to do DIY, mm-hmm. like you can just pay a subscription to get access to that rather than yeah. owning it. So it's, it's, it creates the incentive to, um, to, uh, I suppose like, 
um, to, to spend less money, but to actually to get access to better stuff through it. Um, and that's not only on a on a on a um, an individual level, but also on a on a municipal level. Like I know Los Angeles um, pay a subscription now to um, Philips for lighting as a service as a uh, for their street lighting, as opposed to having to spend a lot of money on worse, less quality light bulbs for their whole city. Mm. And it, it saves money for Los Angeles and it saves material use. For Philips, and it also costs Philips less money because they're spending less money on supply chain and materials and things as well. So I suppose, like on every level of society, having access to materials over ownership um, can be beneficial. Mm. There was a um, there's a line the World Economic Forum. Something they wrote was, "In the future, you'll own nothing and be happy about it," <laughs> 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 which sounds awful. But what they meant was. Um, that actually it's very if you don't have to own a car you can have access to car sharing you yeah. don't have to own tools you know if you have access to renting these things mm. you will have to spend less money you'll be less encumbered you'll have less debt and you know yeah. ultimately your life will be better because you own less stuff well, um, I, I think that 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 needs to there's a healthy dose of skepticism that could be used there like i mean you could also say like uber for example car sharing and like i mean it's not car sharing but it's like providing mobility as a service as opposed yeah. to owning your own car but like the the zero hour contracts that people are on or god i don't even know if it's zero hour contracts it's like freelancing essentially yeah. like we are we're all familiar with the, the problems that are associated with those kind of things like the way that the circular economy manifests needs to be done with regulate good regulation mm. um, and i suppose like one of the things that we're doing in the rediscovery center that tries to do that is is just our focus on social enterprise um you know we have four social enterprises um at the rediscovery center um paint bikes fashion and furniture and like i, I mentioned what they do earlier on but but as part of their um, brief they also um house sorry Alan, they also do labor reactivation programs which mm-hmm. essentially um means that pe- people who might have had distance from the labor market for a long time for whatever reason they come to the rediscovery center they they learn circular economic skills over a period of time um, and after their their time with us you know, they hopefully have the skills to go back into the workforce for for decent circular jobs um, and they have a 90% success rate um, at the moment. So, I mean, it's wow. a it's a successful way of ensuring that, you know, skills, job creation um, for, for people who might otherwise um, not have that opportunity. So it's, I suppose, like the way that the circular economic economy manifests itself is, is going to be really important. Like we also know, like big companies like um, that have the goal of making profit at their heart mm. who, who, who need to keep their shareholders happy are looking at the circular economy as a way to make money and that's true you know i mean it's it, yeah. we know that it, within the fashion industry for example secondhand clothing let renting and leasing like those are now bigger financially than um fast fashion like it, it's it's circular business models are now outpacing um uh, fast fashion business models so big organizations are now looking to the circular economy to make money but i think it's just really important to try to push the kinds of circular manifestation that can also benefit society um as well and that's not to say that you know these big picture corporations don't have environmental goals or social goals but the the, the fact that we don't um, have that financial drive at our heart means that we can have the space to focus on benefiting society, benefiting the environment. Mm. I guess that might that might be like a, a an antagonistic question: is it's like does a circular economy mean less jobs? Because it means there's less industrial production. Well, that's you know a lot of people's livelihoods are linked to the linear economy. That's absolutely true. And um, there's been some really good work from uh, Circle Economy who are a Dutch organization um, based in Amsterdam, and they have got some really good work. They've got a good uh, jobs and skills program there, but they're like, they're putting out statistics, like there are going to be loads of jobs made by the circular economy, you know, and it's true. There are going to be a lot of jobs in repair, recycling, remanufacture. That's all coming down the line. But I suppose the goal is to make sure that those jobs are um, good jobs, you know, because recycling as a profession is hard like it's a Mm. it's a difficult career people like repairing like i mean if you're if repairing stuff is also very very difficult so it's it's just trying to make sure that the way that the circular economy is manifested is also um in line with our social ambitions yeah 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 Mm. um what do, do you find much 
in the way of, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot happening at the high level, like government led policy, top down. Mm -hmm. Is there stuff happening at the grassroots level as well? Yes. Right. So this is, um, this is a really good question. And I suppose like it's, um, it's the, the, the question of like rural Ireland versus um, urban manifestations of the circular economy has been playing on my mind a lot. Um, and a lot of a lot of the grassroots stuff that I'm seeing at the moment um, is happening in rural rural Ireland. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so a lot. Well, that's not to say that they're not happening in cities as well. But I'm just maybe it's that I'm just pleasantly surprised to see it there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of the the conversations that are happening around the circular economy are focused on cities. You know, people who people who you know, um, you know, and that that makes sense because the cities are at the intersection of you know social life economic life government education like we know that it's all happening in cities um but i i i I just have this idea in my head that rural ireland is just going to be like a bastion of circular economic transition um and maybe that's because in ireland you know um cities like irish cities don't no irish city has a directly elected mayor yet so compared with amsterdam compared with paris you know we we um, you know Anne Hidalgo in Paris and uh, Femke Halsema is in, in Amsterdam, I think, and um, like they have produced really ambitious circular um, strategies for their cities. Um, but like, uh, I just I just see a lot of really good grassroots stuff happening in rural Ireland, and they're really sophisticated. And um, like, for example, when I was in, um, I went to Ballina, which is a um, the biggest town in County Mayo, and there's about ten thousand people living in it in Ballina. Um, and Mayo, for your listeners who don't know, it's it's on the west coast of Ireland. It's quite a rural county. Um, but Ballina, I mean, they have some serious ambitions to become Ireland's most sustainable town. They've got a great, a really great group of architects have just moved there um, from the Netherlands. Actually, they used to work in MVRDB in the Dutch design architecture firm there. And they moved down to Ballina and they're really like shaking things up. But they're mm-hmm. supported by the local community because they see this ambition this green ambition that they have how it can also benefit their um tourism how it can benefit their local economy how it can create jobs like it's really um very very impressive um but even beyond balana like w- the, the the reason i was in balana i was at a cop 26 event um and we were being presented there was a presentation of um mayo county council hosted this competition to see who would become mayo's decarbonization zone um and we were presented with the winners uh of that competition and um it was won by this really small town called Mulrani and Mulrani essentially it's what we call in Ireland like a shroud valley like it's like a a row of houses um <laughs> that's surrounded by townlands in Mayo that you know um, it's got a hotel it's got a pub it's got a playground but like it's it's not a very big community um and I didn't know what to expect when they got up to present their their decarbonization zone but it was so sophisticated. Like they had this mobility strategy, they had this energy energy strategy. They were collecting data for the last fifteen years. They have a they were they've been lobbying politicians to set up a wind farm in a industrial area because actually the place that they're in it's a very scenic area, so you can't build wind farms there. So they're trying to lobby politicians to get wind farms built. Um, and you know, I mean, they have. I mentioned that mobility strategy as well. Oh, also, they set up a circular economic social enterprise um, that takes the offcuts of Foxford Woolen Mills and upcycles them into new products that they sell and reinvest back into the community. So, like, super sophisticated stuff. And like, there's another. There was another um, group that presented there. They were a townland on the side of a hill, and they've done all of a lot of what Mulrani are also doing. And like, their name escapes me now. But they also have invested in like micro hydroelectric power um, wow. uh, for all of the tiny streams run, running off their local mountain. You know, I mean, it's like it, it just gave me a lot of um, hope, I suppose, that like, mm. I mean, you know, it was at COP26. We were seeing all this poly- like you know, it was really fretful stuff that was coming out. Yeah, and like, yeah. I suppose the folk, the the the. the just seeing all this community action like it just gave me so much hope um and uh yeah i don't know i see community action as being really um a really pivotal part of ireland's circular economic transition that's amazing it's so great to hear all these things happening that probably fly under the radar quite a bit yeah exactly you know people like me who are like urbanists and are very focused on cities 
Right. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I, I wonder, will this sort of help to maybe address the balance of economic growth around mm. Ireland? Because, you know, for, Ireland has a world city, Dublin, which is like yeah. a major financial hub. And then it has a couple of small cities, Galway, uh, Cork, Limerick. And then the mm-hmm. rest of the, the, the country is very rural. Yeah. Um, and so you, you obviously have, there is obviously this feeling of like a lot of money does flow towards Dublin and mm. maybe the rest of the country doesn't feel like it, it get, it's, it's difficult to get investment mm. pulled away from Dublin. But this, if we have these sort of local initiatives happening mm. that are very like location specific, mm. that, that seems like it could be a really interesting way of, of sort of of maintaining it. that rural vitality you know yeah yeah like i suppose like i mean if you can compare it with amsterdam like amsterdam have um pockets of the city that are kind of cordoned off for experimentation for different ways of urban living and that i know that that model really works like they in the in the pipe for example they've gotten rid of all the parking spaces and they've made sure that they, they're now community allotments you know i mean if you could, I suppose, copy and paste that to rural Ireland, like if you have specific mm. rural towns that you're like, okay, we're going to try and experiment with this or that. Like, I mean, you could take that model um, and try it out, I suppose, in, in in various rural communities. And I suppose like the, I, I think the fact that rural Ireland, a lot of rural Irish towns have really strong communities just benefits that transition. You know, right. I mean, the things like, tidy towns i don't know if any of your listeners are, will be familiar with tidy towns it's essentially i know people i mean it's seen as kind of like a uh, pokey like putting flowers in window boxes and sweeping the streets kind of thing and making sure your town looks nice but like the amount of um and like the stuff that's coming out of tidy towns for from from a sustainability perspective would blow your mind like there's abbey leaks which is um a very small town in leash um oh god i was looking at their tidy town stuff unbelievable they hired a circular economic sorry not a circular communicator a climate communicator called uh, neve shaw i don't know how they got money for this but neve shaw <laughs> essentially spent a, a, did a residency down in abbey leaks um to um to, to bring the local community on this kind of sustainable journey and it's just you can go onto their website and take a look at it but like unbelievable like they were getting forty thousand people on their facebook live streams like i mean it was just oh. unbelievable stuff like very, very impressive. And I think like building on those networks that are already there, like Tidy Towns, is just so valuable. You know, it's so valuable. It's, yes, it's very difficult to be anonymous in rural Ireland. You will be part of the community totally. with, whether you want Actually, to or not. Actually, that's a good, a good my, my little sister, um, just a personal story, moved to the west of Ireland um, in the pandemic. And like when she was there, the local sustainability initiative knocked on her door for her to get involved, like try, try to rope her into stuff. Like it's, so like you cannot, where the community is that strong, like there's no way you're going to escape. Um, and, if the commu- <laughs> and that's a good and a bad thing. Like if you, if you have, if you focus the drive of that community towards sustainability, towards the circular economy, like there's only good things that can come of it. And um, what I would, the, the difficulty that I see between these towns is uh, knowledge sharing, actually. Like I think, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of towns. I mean, they're also competing with each other. Like it's really competitive. Um, but there's a lot of good initiatives that are happening in one place that, you know, people just don't know about on the other side of the country, but it could be totally relevant to them. So I would say, yeah, knowledge sharing is a big, a big hurdle um for those communities. Um yeah, but I was I was just gonna say as well, I might did I mention earlier the our rural future strategy from the um, Department of Rural and Community Development? Uh just briefly, but yeah, please please go into it. Yeah, that that I mean that that strategy is so um is so ambitious and its goal is to really rejuvenate Irish rural towns, especially in light of the pandemic, with social enterprise, with with the circular economy. And I think that it's um I've I've got a lot of hope uh, in that kind of a strategy because it's just like I don't know. It's it's really really impressive. Um, but just on that point that um, a lot of money is going towards Dublin. Like rural Ireland has got a department in government dedicated to rural development. Like the urban like cities don't have that, and cities don't mm. have a directly elected mayor either. So maybe the reason why there are so many good examples of um, sustainable initiatives in rural Ireland is I don't know. Maybe they have more. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say maybe they have more support, but I doubt that people from rural Ireland would say that. Um, <laughs> but then I suppose there are there are really good examples of um, sustainable initiatives happening in Dublin as well. Like 
the community cleanups, Ballybock is a really good community cleanup, Fibsborough, um, uh, Crumlin, Crumlin community cleanup. I just had a, actually, I was just talking with them the other day and they were just saying the same thing, you know, where there's strong communities, um, sustainable initiatives kind of thrive, you know. Um, con- considering your experience in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. is there anything that they do over there that you would love to just bring in and apply to Ireland or you think would work well? Oh my God. I mean, Ireland has a, um, and I think the Dutch don't have this. Ireland have a, actually, no, that's not true. Never mind. I'm going to have to think. I was going to say, you know that thing that Irish have, like, ah, who do you think you are? Like that kind of things of notions. <laughs> yes. Do you yeah. know that? Do you know that thing? Like, People who are maybe like myself, who are kind of, you know, trying to be sustainable and all this kind of stuff like there's a bit of like, oh, sure. Look at who's just sustainable guy coming down. Like, I mean, people kind of take the mick out of each other. And I suppose yeah. that that's, might, that's that part of like, people. that's part of like being part of these like really strong communities is that you're expected to sort of conform a bit yeah. to how the community is and if you're if you're different i mean you do get called out on it in ireland that's true and but then again in the netherlands like they have this same saying actually i'm I'm just contradicting myself when i'm talking about it like they have this thing called do normal which means be normal uh and they (laughs) they have this saying that's like be normal uh normal is crazy enough as it is or something like that um and essentially (laughs) like it's like also this this drive to conform um but I suppose like in maybe maybe the exception is just Amsterdam. Like Amsterdam is is a place mm. where innovation is um is seen as being really valuable. Uh, and they really invest in innovation. Um you can see it even like if you go over to King's Day, um this King's Day celebration in the Netherlands, like all of the children go out and just try to sell stuff in the street. And it's usually <laughs> the kids that are most out there, most innovative. Um, that get the most attention, that gets the most, get the most money, and this thing of like um, entrepreneurship is like embedded in the youth from a very young age, and that kind of mindset I don't think exists in Ireland. Like it's the drive to innovate is like the drive to better your communities is very much there, but the, the drive mm. to let's say experiment with urban farming within a community might not might be seen as being a bit too out there you know right um, so, so that, i think yeah it, willingness to like try new ideas and and just see where it goes yeah but then i suppose the, like again looking at balana like they they've their their strategy you know is so out there like it's really quite <laughs> it's really quite impressive um and i was in killarney the other day actually and they have a urban farm there too so yeah i mean maybe maybe um in coming back to ireland after eight years in the netherlands i need to re remind myself of where the, the country is at at the moment um you know there there's it may or maybe it's the exception that proves the rule i don't know <laughs> very good question i don't really yeah. know an answer. <laughs> so well it's, it's so true though isn't it because amsterdam i feel like amsterdam likes to be the first to do things like true. for instance with the um they have their donut economics plan their circularity yeah. plan i know they were one of the first cities to really spearhead that yeah um, whereas many other places really don't want to be the first because they they're afraid that they'll you know it'll be a waste of time and money they prefer to Mm. see what other people do and then you know take a more cautious approach Mm. um so it's kind of high risk high reward i suppose yeah exactly like there there's definitely um like cities compete with each other and i know that like in 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 the netherlands when i was there like i was i used to work for an architecture firm called uh, un studio who um they have a really great urban design team there and they were doing some fantastic initiatives in what would be maybe more provincial uh dutch towns and by provincial by dutch standards not provincial by irish standards at all but um they were doing i mean they were doing really out there like the stuff was really out there and like the reason for those towns to do that is because they could see that the jobs and the innovation and the you know the the drive to move to bigger cities um is big amongst younger people. So like they, they, to, to attract jobs, to attract people, to sustain themselves as towns, they need to make sure that they're on the map. Um, so pushing innovation um, for, for small towns. Yeah. As you said, you know, the, the risk is big, but the payoff is also, if it works um, can help the town from drying up. Um, something else you mentioned to me before that I think they've done in Amsterdam is um, like mapping the circular economy or mapping waste streams. Mm, yeah. So what, yeah. what's that about? 
Um, well, I know that the, the they do kind of, um, the, again, Circular Economy, that group I mentioned earlier on, they do kind of um, city scans, which oh, yeah. are which track the waste streams across the urban scale. And they, they basically, yeah, look at where the waste is going and um, where the circular op- opportunities are. Um, I mean, and it's across, I mean, it's not even, it's post-consumer, it's pre-consumer, it's in, um, in you know, like industrial, industrial um, sectors as well. Um, and essentially that that mapping process highlights the gaps the, mm. the the gaps where circularity can play a role in reducing waste but also um creating um, new economies um and I suppose like that that is happening um for many cities um but we um have the ambition to also do one in Dublin um Dublin will be hosting um the circular economy hotspot in 2023 and we hope to have a similar scan done um for dublin but i think the dif- the difference maybe between um dublin and other cities is that dublin like we're an island economy and we're we're, we're mm-hmm. very much isolated so our economy the dublin dublin's waste streams i assume might be more linked to rural surroundings um and I'm actually, I'm not I, like the Netherlands, for example, like, I mean, you've got a massive port, you've got huge industry mm. happening there. So the, the industrial waste streams might be more, might, might be more apparent there. But for Ireland, I imagine like the, the, this whole focus on the bioeconomy so from waste streams coming from agriculture could be pretty high. And we don't know until we've done that mapping, yeah. but I think it's going to, um, it's really going to be an interesting scan, um, yeah, I'm, I, 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 and again, like we, we don't know if it's going to happen yet. We still have to secure funding, but we, we right. definitely need to de- need to do it. It's the same with that, you know, um, that market research that we're doing at the moment. Like, if you know where you're coming from, if you know where you're starting from, you can make plans to foster the circular economy and yeah. to, to do it in a way that's relevant and to not waste energy. Um, yeah, yeah it's it's about like a systems thinking approach where to, yeah. to understand where you can intervene, you have to first map the system out. And yeah, that sounds exactly. like a very literal sense of mapping out the waste streams, because mm-hmm. um, otherwise, as you said, you just don't know. And you're, you're. It's great to promote all these grassroots organizations and and have the you know high level policies in place. But if you don't have the baseline data, you'll you won't necessarily you know you won't yeah. solve the problem by accident. You need to know <laughs> what you're doing, basically. Exactly. Okay, so I'll move on to my final question, which I ask all guests, which is from your perspective, what needs to happen or change in the next decade? to ensure successful climate action yeah i think that there's there's a lot that can be said here about regulation and policy you know public buy-in and technology and the rest of it but i suppose to my my main thing and and you know harking back to what i was saying about rural ireland i think that community like strong communities lead to strong and successful sustainable initiatives like it top down stuff doesn't always work like you need to have bottom up support and usually top down bottom up that can like meet in the middle and have a kind of a a, a public buy in in the in the middle ground and um, but those strong communities are really necessary um and whether you see that in a big city like in the in the where I mentioned, you know, communities like Crumlin and, and Fibsra here in Dublin or, you know, small town community Ireland. Like we need resilient communities um, to to see us through this this issue. And it also like, I mean, communities and, and, and friendships, especially like acting as a group helps me at least to feel less anxious about this this issue. Um, like that knowing that there's solidarity amongst my peers and, and amongst friends and that we're just trying our best like i mean that's that's mm-hmm. all you can really do um so i suppose are any architects or urban planners that are listening to this podcast that are designing homes that might isolate people you know i would say it's very easy for me to say stop what you're doing but at least you know, like, <laughs> try to if there's if there's ways to integrate community into the things that architects are designing and that urban mm-hmm. planners are designing like uh that's that's i think the way forward you know communities community action I love that. I think that's such a good point. I mean, I think it's something I've been, has been, uh, you know, has been occurring to me more and more um, recently, mm. particularly as I do these podcast episodes, because I think a lot of the training you get as an urban designer or an architect or an engineer is that you're the expert, you have the skills, you can drop in yeah. and you'll, you know, make the right decision. You'll, you'll create the, the best design for that place. Mm. 
Um, mm-hmm. And what I'm what I'm realizing more and more is that actually designers are more like about facilitators. yeah facilitating and also like translating. So so yeah. getting people around a table and seeing what they want and need from a place, and then translating that through your you know your technical skills into a design that works. Yeah, I suppose like that's, I mean, that's how the Rediscovery Center started out. Like we were a public consultation, you know, I mean, like having that knowledge from the community as to what they need, um, I think is so totally relevant. And then also like making sure that the environmental concerns that you have, um, or the vi- environmental strategies that you have also answer social needs and economic mm. needs to try to make sure that people have good, secure jobs and um, and uh, to try to iron out any social issues that might be might be there. Yeah to make it relevant for people. Brilliant. I think that's such a good point to end on. Um, where can people find out more about you and the Rediscovery Center online? You can find us on um, yeah, rediscoverycenter.ie. Uh, also, you know, on all the social media channels that you're, you'd be familiar with. But I'd say actually the best way to get to know about us is come and visit, you know, come and visit the center. Um, and it's, like, it's, it's a place that does itself justice in real life. Mm. Um, because it is the circular economy on a, a the lived experience of it on a human scale and on an architectural scale so come and visit us take the tour um tell your friends about us and um yeah come and come, uh, buy some of our upcycled stuff in our in our shop you know i mean it, it not only um saves materials from going to landfill it also supports a good community cause so um yeah come and visit 